Everyone, I want to welcome you to small group tonight. And, you know, here we are week six. And can we just take a moment and pause and look at what God has been doing? I, I don't know what your small group experience has been like. And seriously, if you've missed one, you can catch the video up or go back. If you missed a Sunday, go back and watch a Sunday. Because while they stand alone, they keep saying that. All of these subjects that we're talking about that get us on our journey, get us unstuck, get us moving, they stand alone. If you've never been obedient to baptism, I baptized a guy today who's been a believer his whole life. And he's like, I've just not been obedient to it. And I said, God's going to God's gonna come in and bless you. Uh, we saw Elaine last week, 80 some years old, who said, I was two years old when I was a baby. And she got baptized. And so if that's your one thing, you know, like you go back and watch that or, you know, that stands alone. The idea of biblical community, it stands alone. And if you're a Lone Ranger monk Christian, you're, you're not going to make it. It's going to be tough. It's, it's, it's not the beauty of what God has. And, you know, when you unwrap the present of life in Christ, I, I really look at it as a present that God gives you. It's, it's a slow unwrap. It's not like, here it is, and you experience the totality of Jesus in your life. It, it, that's impossible. The, the, the fact that... Um, it's a slow unwrap is what's so beautiful about it because it keeps getting better, but you can't fully dive into all that Christian community has at you because you get it one little day at a time being known and knowing other people and them blessing you and the encouragement and the accountability and the, the discipleship and the growth. and uh, it's, it's a slow unwrap. So that one sermon, that one small group on biblical community, communion was what we kind of really tied it into, you know, it's, it stands alone, but it, it builds, doesn't it? And, you know, we started this whole thing with letting something go, and I keep going back and reviewing because they stand alone. It's one thing that could get us unstuck and move us on the journey, but they build. They always build on one another because we're building lives. We're building, you know, a future. We're building lives. So this week... Uh, Pastor Rick Russall, dear friend, uh, he's been here many times. Rick talked to us about uh, kind of like that next layer of journey. And I'm telling you, it is tied. All of these things, if, if you're stuck in some way, this way gets you unstuck. And it's impossible to talk about this next piece without kind of pulling back to some of these others. The topic this week, our sermon, uh, week six is evangelism. Uh, Rick probably will talk about neighboring, right? Because that's that's really what's close to Rick's heart. And I, I think it's what Jesus did. I want to take you to a moment in the life of Christ that I go to in my heart if I'm driving down the road, if uh, I always talk about how Jennifer and I are having a conversation. We talk about this. I mean, we, we live in the text. And when we were in Israel last time, we talked about it. And it's in John chapter 2. Immediately, you're going to know the story. You're going to know, you know, the major idea of what happened. Jesus turns water to wine. A couple of facts. This is the first miracle of Jesus' ministry. He's reluctant. It's done in biblical community. It's a miracle that cost him something. Right, let, let's, just, let's just read John chapter 1. Actually, John chapter 2. Here it happens. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And Jesus was also invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, sounds like a great wedding, uh, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, and please do not put uh, our culture's negative context on this, you know. Uh, li like Listen to... Put, put tone. You know, when someone texts and we infer tone that's wrong, put good tone on this. Jesus says to her, put good tone on it. Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Um, you know, if, if I were to answer Jennifer, if she walked in the room and I'd be like, woman, this has nothing to do with me. That probably wouldn't go over well. But this wasn't, you know, you're, you're translating this text the, the word, you know, he recognizes her, you know, just as a female form. It's not bad that he's, don't put, you know, him being disrespectful to his mother. He's just being very clear. Like, like what is this problem at this wedding that we're both attending? I don't think it's my problem. 
right? He says, my time of like engaging and telling people who I am, it's not here. And his mother said to the servants, <laughs> I love this, how mothers can be. Hey, she doesn't even respond to Jesus. She looks at the servant and says, do whatever he tells you to do. She doesn't argue with him about his time. Now, I want to pause here. A few years ago, like actually a lot of years ago, when The Passion of Christ came out, uh, the Mel Gibson movie, uh, we were we were on the road. We were really busy. I'm a movie guy. Love, love movies. Uh, see a lot of movies. But people early on were like, have you seen The Passion of Christ? And I know I was out traveling. Um, I, I just hadn't seen it. Are you one of those people where when... The more people tell you to do something, the more you're like, yeah, I'm not going to do that. When, like, when a new movie comes out, like, it's so good. Have you seen it? Have you seen it? Have you seen it? There are some personality types. And every now and then I can be like this, where the more people talk about it, I'm like, I'm not going to see it. I'm not going to see it. I kind of got this thing with The Passion of Christ, the movie, because, listen, I've read the book. The book is always better than the movie. I mean, I'll tell you that. I've read, I'm a reader. I'm a prolific reader. And every time I see... A movie based on the book. I'm always disappointed. Why? Because you can't put those kind of details in. You can't do it. It'll. The movie will never be better than the book. It might help you with one scene, imagine it in a different way. But we're, our, our mind does a better job of, of putting those characters together and the feeling and the emotion and all of the subtleties that build up a moment. And the, the book is always better than the movie. So when people were getting on my case, like, I can't believe you haven't seen The Passion, they were starting to like, get all judgy with me about, like, <laughs> like I'm not a good Christian. Like, I'm sorry, when did The Passion of Christ, that movie that Mel Gibson made with, I think it was Jim Caviezel, when did that become canonized as the Holy Scripture? You know, people were acting like I hadn't read the Bible, like I hadn't been, you know going to church, or I wasn't, you know, a part of biblical community, or I'd never been baptized, and I don't take communion. It's like, guys, it's a movie. It is not a part of our faith, right? Then I saw it. It was really, it was, it was really good, you know? I mean, I should probably go back and watch it. I don't normally watch movies, new movies twice, but honestly, it, it had some parts where it strengthened my faith. It, it was really, really good. I think about that whole time of my life because I've been a big um, proponent of. I have on stage and publicly and kind of like ascri like prescribed to some people, you know what you should do? You should go and watch um, The Chosen. And uh, it's been a while since I've talked about it. I, I talk about it with folks in the lobby a lot. Here's one of the reasons why I've been liking uh, what what is going on with this film, The Chosen, this series it puts me back in the text there's an episode on uh, jesus at the wedding and i would uh i would again say if you haven't seen it have some fun and go go watch it maybe watch it as a small group at some time not during small groups tonight because i want you to have a good discussion but can i just tell you what you already know because we're we're reading this text it said jesus was invited to the wedding with his disciples so pause jesus went to the wedding. He was invited and he went. What Jesus didn't do at this moment was say, I'm going to be more holy than that and I'm going to go and have time reading the ancient text or I'm going to go out and be with the, just the Father and the Spirit. Jesus did that. He did it a lot. He didn't do it all the time. I mean, there was a party. It was in the place where Jesus' ministry would be. Right? I mean, this was in Cana. This was around the galley. This was this this was where he was gonna do ministry. And his his mom knew people there. So think about it. Jesus went. If you watch that movie, it's meaningful that she was gonna see her son. And she loves her son. And um his friends were all gonna be there. And she was gonna get to meet some of the apostles and they would die for Jesus. And here Jesus was gonna introduce Mary, his mother, to these men that would one day die for him. And they were going to be at a fun thing, you know. And Jesus wasn't preaching at this wedding. They were dancing. There's a there's a movie where they're make um, in the movie that shows them they're making fun of one of the guys at his two left feet, and we see Jesus dance. Just the reality of the, he's a person, and he cares. And mo his mom comes to him, and he looks at his mom, and he says, "Ain't nobody got time for that, <laughs> right?" Uh, 
I love that we're doing this week six, and it's all about evangelism. As we come up to the largest recognized holiday in America, it is not Easter. It is not Christmas. It's not Thanksgiving. The largest recognized holiday in America is the celebration of death, Halloween. Now, I know, I, I, I know all the etymologies. There are numerous strains of where, where the, the origins, the beginning of a, a festival of the fall happens. And there are religious ones, biblical ones, God-given ones, and pagan ones in every culture. But our culture, America, where we all live, it is the largest holiday of the year. Growing up, there were seasons where my parents were like, we don't celebrate that. And then there were seasons where we celebrated our Christian community version of, well, we're all going to get together and celebrate harvest. And Here's what I want to challenge us to do as a church. I want to challenge us to do what Jesus did. There's a bunch of people gathering. Go and be a Christian there. Actually, we're going to put together with uh, our small group notes. Uh, we're sending out... Uh, how, how you can best celebrate in community, with your community, you know, do's and don'ts, and how we can be very evangelistic with Halloween and what's going on. This I, I meet more neighbors. I have more meaningful connections on the night of Halloween that's coming up here very soon than I do the rest of the year, you know, because I'm not in the church lobby, um, just outside our house, and so we show uh, Charlie Brown's uh, Great Pumpkin whatever it is we we run it every year and we show it and uh people love it and kids stop and uh shake hands with people that have attended our church or left or moved or visiting and people that might one day come to church and people who have come but they're like oh pastor i'm gonna come back and i'm just a guy in my community loving people and there are significant spiritual conversations where i help people move closer to knowing jesus that happen on that night and you know some people could say, well, how, how can you celebrate something like that? No, I'm, I'm just in a culture like Daniel was, and I'm being Christ in me, loving people. And sure, some of them have had way too many jello shots, right? Um, we're handing out waters and coffee and letting people know that we're going to celebrate Christmas and they can come. Uh, but we're also just being people, right? And in this text... Jesus had his own timeline. I, I just love it when we see the... He was all God, and he can say when things start. But you know what I love about Jesus here? You know how the story ends. Jesus turns water to wine. But that front part is the most important part to me because Jesus says, "This is I'm, I'm, not, I'm not ready for this. This is not the time. And Jesus even allowed his schedule, the maker of time, allowed his schedule to be interrupted by what? People. You're never going to do evangelism if you don't allow your life to be interrupted by people. And you're not intentional about it. And um, I think he looked at his mother and he saw this bride and this groom and he was like, I can do it. You know what you can do? You can, uh, if there's not a lot of trick-or-treaters that come to your house, go to someone else's in your small group. Maybe your small group needs to have the party house, right? It's like, why is this house so awesome? Oh, it's our small group doing it. Right? Maybe you're stronger together. And um, don't hold up. Don't miss this opportunity. Make it holy. That which, you know, the enemy has said we're going to sell it. We can, we're adjacent, you know, it's being scared and ghouls and goblins. and It's like adjacent to demonic, I know. But redeem it for the glory of Jesus and be like, well, we're here celebrating all that. The kids are coming out right now for playground time. Uh we, we want you to, to dive into what evangelism is. And I want you to think about it even in light of Jesus. People interrupted him too, but he always loved people. And evangelism interrupts your life. But if you're ready for it, your life will be better. And it's a natural progression that you're going to want to share the good news of Jesus when you understand how biblical community is awesome. And you've given something up. And you have gone through baptism. All of these steps so far are going to make you want to say, the next natural thing is to share Jesus. We're in a beautiful season of sharing Jesus with this holiday, this fall holiday. 
and then the holiday of all holiday seasons, which is Christmas season. Uh, our, our church is at the doorstep of a beautiful, beautiful season. Let's not miss it. Lord Jesus, would you bless our conversations tonight about personal evangelism and how our small group can do it together. Some of us aren't good at this, so, but some of us don't know that we really are. We're better at one-on-one -on -one relationships and, and walking with someone in a significant way. Some of us are social butterflies and we can gather a bunch of people and you know, we're good at pulling people in and creating a fun environment. It takes all of it. It takes all of us and we can all grow in every area. Some of us can be more welcoming and some of us can learn how to go deeper and uh, let us not look down on either, you know, introvert, extrovert. You made all of us and all of us are needed to evangelize, to share, evangel, to share good news, the good news of who you are, Jesus. So tonight, we're going to be honest about maybe we've not been evangelistic ever in our life at all, but you're calling us to grow in this area. Some of us have, we've shared about, everyone knows we're a Christian, but we've not helped anyone grow deeper as a Christian. All of us have a next step in personal neighboring, as Rick would say, or evangelism. And wherever we are, we are the plan for evangelism. We don't have to go to Africa, right, to do that. It starts where we are. It starts in our neighborhood. It starts with this season. So Jesus, just like you were interrupted, let, let us not miss the interruptions. And may tonight, may this conversation be holy. And may you just move us one step further, closer to you and doing your will. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey guys, may you have a great night, morning, whatever it is in small group this week, and we'll see you next week. God bless.